The Fox 25 News at 9 begins with breaking news. We come to you with breaking news tonight. Yukon Public Schools putting a notice out to parents tonight. The Yukon High School will be on soft lockdown tomorrow. This after officials say they were made aware of a possible threat towards the school. Police say they are increasing security at that school and absences will not count against students on Monday if they feel it is necessary to stay home. The president of OU, Joseph Harrows Jr., putting out a statement tonight regarding the Friday night incident. In it, he says he's grateful for first responders, over 100 officers from multiple agencies for running into perceived danger without hesitation. He also says with assistance from the FBI, they confirmed this was a swatting incident. That's where callers fake an emergency to draw a large law enforcement response. At this time, the calls appear to have come from outside the country. And new tonight, Tulsa police are investigating a shooting at an East Tulsa apartment complex. They got the call a little before one o'clock this afternoon. Investigators say they were told the shooter was wearing a red mask. They are still looking for him at the moment. When officer arrived, he observed a guy kind of half in and out of his driver's seat of his car. Blood was on the ground. He turned him over and looked and saw he was shot uh, as he was doing that initial assessment, fire and EMSA were rolling up, so they took over the first aid, scooped him up and hauled him to St. Francis. He had a collapsed lung. Doctors reinflated the lung. Looks like he's going to live. Police aren't releasing the victim's name at this time. Officers say neighbors told them they don't think he lives there, but have seen him before. As for the suspect, police say neighbors saw him walking around the complex earlier with another man. A murder suicide at this home in Vertigris. The OSBI is helping with this investigation. While a spokesperson couldn't tell us much, they did say a man and woman died and another man was shot and taken to the hospital. The OSBI isn't saying how serious his injuries are or how the three are related. As the social media world continues to grow and lawmakers debate over allowing platforms like TikTok in our country, many question the effect these apps may have on youth mental health. Fox 25's Katie Arada spoke to a psychiatrist about this issue. So Katie, what did you learn? Well, David, experts say social media does affect youth mental health in both positive and negative ways, but they advise parents to educate their children on the internet and social media so they, they know that everything online is not always as it seems. It's really important with the teen population to educate. Let them know that this is the highlighted reel of everybody. Social media is not real life. Um, it's very common for kids to experience FOMO, thinking other kids are living better lives than they are. Dr. Safai says simply having social media like TikTok would probably not cause a mental illness, but could create a problem if one already exists. Yeah, I don't think it would have created a mental illness. I think it exacerbates it. I think it... Um, if they, they're predisposed to it, have a family history to it, it could trigger it. But can it cause a mental illness? I personally believe it doesn't. Experts say it is important for parents to monitor their child's social media accounts and educate them on the dangers of the Internet. I highly recommend following your kids. And if they're posting things that are inappropriate, educate them. Let them know that pictures you post on the Internet will stay there forever issues and not giving out your locations. They also say it is important to limit screen time as social media is still new and its long term effects are still unclear. We don't know the long term implications of um, being on social media. We're always seeing we're right now seeing immediate effects of it, um, but we don't know the long term effects. So if you, you want to stay on the safe side as a parent, try to limit the amount of screen time in general your kid has because like I said, we just don't know how this is going to impact a kid 10, 20, 30 years down the line. And experts stress the importance of educating your kids on social media and the Internet and how it should be used. For more information on social media and its effects on mental health, go to our website, OKCFox.com. Reporting live in studio, Katie Arada, Fox 25 News. Good evening, everybody, and happy Easter here to you. We had a beautiful weekend across the state and especially for your Sunday here today. Temperatures were warm and into the really mid 70s for most of us. Still water even hit 78 degrees this afternoon. Similar story up there in Ponca City as well. So a warm end of the weekend and we're still pretty mild outside right now. Fairly overcast, cloudy skies, temperatures currently in the mid 60s with overnight lows only expected to drop down into the low 50s. 
One or two real light stray scattered showers might be possible, mainly across the western and northern part of the state. But overall, most of us should remain dry tonight. But tomorrow we do have another chance for some rain and storm. So I'm going to time out those rain chances for you. Plus, I have a look ahead at the rest of your week and our next big weather maker that we're watching as well. That's coming up for you in just a few minutes. It was a beautiful day out there this afternoon. Oklahomans out celebrating Easter or maybe just that nice spring weather. Well, here's some people gathered at Scissor Tail Park er earlier today, chasing eggs and having fun. And over at the Myriad Gardens, the final day of their inaugural Tulip Festival as they prepare for the Festival of the Arts later this month. Concerns tonight from a Washington County property owner that a home his family lost to a devastating wildfire last week could have been saved. John Hayes from our sister station in Tulsa has more and what he says may have started the blaze. It just tore through those lines and just spread all across our land and and ultimately burned our house down. Jesse Larimore spoke with News Channel 8 last week about the gas lines running above what's left of his wife's childhood home, destroyed by a Washington County wildfire. One week later, I'm convinced it was a uh, large factor in, in the amount of loss that we had. And he says his opinion hasn't changed. After uh, the news came out on Saturday, directly after the fires, my wife went back on Tuesday and walked the lines and, and it was still on fire. Laramore says that was the reason he and his wife decided to call a number listed next to the gas wells that the lines were attached to for help. When I talked to the supervisor, he said that everything was normal. It was not nothing to worry about. Laramore says that tone changed in this text message shared with us, saying that a burned poly pipe in one of the units was being removed. This was done. They've taken all the piping. Laramore documenting the aftermath of the work. He says he was originally told wasn't necessary. All the lines are removed now, so there's no evidence that there was any lines other, like I said, other than the indentation. News Channel 8 reached out to the Oklahoma Corporation Commission on Laramore's behalf. A spokesperson said as there's no paperwork for the abandoned well, so figuring out who's responsible for them may be difficult. The well lines do lay on Osage tribal property, though, so Laramore says he has been in contact with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. I know that they are very concerned about it, and they're actively looking into it for us. That was our sister station in Tulsa. Laramore says it's too early to decide if his family will rebuild a home on the property after this situation is resolved, though he says there are some things that simply can't be replaced. The Oklahoma City Zoo sharing some somber news tonight. Azalea, the zoo's oldest small cat at 20 years old, was put down this week. Azalea was under veterinary care for age-related issues, including seizures. They say the average life expectancy for her species is normally 12 years. Her long life was a testament to the advanced care she received. Conversations about possible reparations for the 1921 Tulsa race massacre are starting this week. This comes nearly two years after a city council resolution apologized for what happened. As Daniela Ibarra from our sister station in Tulsa explains, organizers say these sessions are a step towards justice. Descendants of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre survivors say it's time to move beyond apology. Apology is a good first step, but we're at the point now of taking action. Action beginning with listening sessions. Based Greg Robinson is helping organize the conversation. And so this is a community led process to listen, to educate ourselves, and then to understand where we should prioritize repairing uh, the harms done by the Tulsa Race Massacre. We shall overcome. During the centennial, Tulsa City Council apologized for the massacre. This was not a, a reparations proposal. Uh, reparations is land and cash. Everything else is good policy. Last year, City Council approved a resolution to move forward with meetings across Tulsa to talk about ways to repair Greenwood. City Councilor Jamie Fowler told us then the proposal includes reparations for race massacre survivors and descendants, tuition for descendants, and tax incentives for Greenwood business owners. There's nothing that is set in stone, but there will be things, uh, solutions, or the next step beyond apology. All Tolsons are welcome to the conversations. 
Robinson says people will get to hear from experts and share their own perspectives. It is not a space to debate the merits of repairing the harms uh, that have resulted from the Tulsa Race Massacre, but it is a space where everyone can come educate themselves. Robinson says they plan to compile a report on the perspective shared to present to council this summer. We're hoping that as they committed to in their resolution, that they take uh, recommendations that uh, may be evident in the report uh, and begin putting action plans together uh, to make those things happen. Reporting in Tulsa, I'm Danielle Ibarra. And the criminal case against former President Donald Trump rolling through the legal system as his defense team plans their next move. National correspondent Kayla Gaskins joins us now from Washington with the latest. Donald Trump's legal team preparing to ask the judge to toss out the case against the former commander in chief. It is an absurd situation that multiple prosecutors pass by this rancid ham sandwich of an indictment and Alvin Bragg suddenly decides to do it. If that doesn't work, Lawyer Jim Trusty saying they'll push to move the case out of Manhattan, where Joe Biden won 85 percent of the vote in 2020, then start to pull at numerous legal threads he argues will unravel the entire case. Legal motions that pick apart the statute of limitations problem, the specific intent problem, the bootstrapping of perhaps federal election law into a New York case. There's a lot to play with there. Former Attorney General Bill Barr echoing agreement. It is transparently uh, an abuse of uh, prosecutorial power to accomplish a political end. Democratic lawyer Alan Dershowitz pointing out while other cases against Trump might have stronger legal grounds, they come with political landmines, like the case involving classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. The case in New York is by far the weakest case. The case in Florida is by far the strongest case, but politically it's difficult because Obviously, Joe Biden and Vice President Pence also had classified material. Greatest president in the history of the world sitting right there. Trump attending a UFC fight in Miami over the weekend, looking happy and relaxed despite the legal troubles. Trump presenting himself as a political martyr. Footage from the indictment, now the centerpiece of a new campaign video. The only crime that I have committed is to fearlessly defend our nation from those who seek to destroy it. At the same time, a new ABC News Ipsos poll shows 53 percent of Americans believe Trump intentionally did something illegal in this case. We are still months away from any legal decisions on how the case will move forward. Motions to dismiss or relocate must be filed by August. The judge will rule on those motions in December. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins. Vice President Kamala Harris traveled to Nashville to advocate for gun control. She met with advocates and lawmakers, including former Tennessee representatives Justin Jones and Justin Pearson. Tennessee's House of Representatives ousted the two for their role in a gun reform protest. Harris condemned their expulsion, calling it an attack on democracy. It wasn't about the three of these leaders, it was about who they were representing. It's about whose voices they were channeling. <laughs> Understand that, and is that not what a democracy allows? A democracy says you don't silence the people, you do not stifle the people, you don't turn off their microphones when they are speaking about the importance very passionate words from Harris right there. According to the White House, Harris's trip means to convey the Biden administration's seriousness about gun reform. While speaking, Harris renewed the administration's call for a ban on assault-style weapons. And this week, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to allow West Virginia to enforce a state law that bans transgender women and girls from participating in female sports teams in public schools. The National Desk's Ryan Smith reports this comes as the Department of Education announced a proposed change to Title IX. The Biden administration Thursday calling for an end to across-the-board bans on transgender student-athletes, the first official counterpunch to Republican bans being implemented across the country. 
In a statement, Education Secretary Miguel Cardona said every student should be able to have the full experience of attending school in America, including participating in athletics free from discrimination. The proposal would still allow schools to block some trans athletes from competing on teams that match their gender identities. The administration's move would make illegal the broad bans on trans student athletes that have already passed in at least 20 states. In Congress, House Republicans are now pushing their own ban. It is a sad reflection on society that the federal government must step in to protect our nation's young women. Singling out and excluding transgender athletes from school sports is detrimental to the mental health of trans students and serves no purpose but to sow division. In 2020, Full Measure host Cheryl Ackeson reported on the issue, sitting down with three Connecticut high school student athletes who filed a federal lawsuit challenging that state's policy allowing students to move from the boys' team to the girls' team without undergoing hormone treatments or surgery. Have all of you lost races and competitions to biological males? Yes, we all have. Okay. How many races? Too many to count. The transgender participation debate doesn't only center around competitive athletes. Nike is now facing boycott calls after partnering with influencer Dylan Mulvaney a transgender woman, to promote sports bras and leggings. It's just this total disdain that, we're, that women are being treated with to at the moment, and particularly in the world of sport where physiology makes so much difference. Before the new federal rule becomes official, the Department of Education will accept comments for 30 days, but expect GOP legal challenges. South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem tweeting, President Biden will see you in court. In Washington, I'm Ryan Smith reporting. Texas Governor Greg Abbott is promising to pardon a U.S. Army sergeant who was convicted of killing a Black Lives Matter protester. Perry was working as a rideshare driver in 2020 when he drove into a Black Lives Matter march in Austin. That's where he fatally shot Garrett Foster, who was an Air Force veteran who was legally carrying a rifle at the time. Now, a jury found Perry guilty of Foster's murder, and he faces life in prison. House GOP leadership has not yet rolled out a budget plan. But according to the New York Times, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is pinning the blame on his second lieutenant, Congressman Scalise. The report says he has no confidence in his budget chair, Jody Arrington, while Democrats say it's time to give up the ghost. The right answer is for Republicans in the House to stop saber rattling, drop the hostage taking and brinksmanship and work together, work by, in a bipartisan way to extend the debt ceiling without strings attached. Really, there's a lot of spending in these agencies that we identified with specific bills and a specific plan. And if we did that, we actually wouldn't reach the debt limit. We would live within our means. The president agrees with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. The ceiling must be extended without strings attached. The limit is supposed to be hit around June return to the public guide today to preside over the Easter Vigil Mass in St. Peter's Basilica. He called on Catholics to be renewed by Easter, preaching about the power of hope over despair. This just one week after he left the hospital over a bout of bronchitis. The ailment forced the Pope to skip Good Friday's nighttime procession at the Colosseum. Ukraine will resume exporting electricity for the first time in six months. The country's energy minister signed an order to resend electricity to the European Union. However, he did say priority will be given to the local population. Ukraine was, sport, was forced to halt energy exports last October after the Russian army launched missile and drone strikes on the country's power grid. Iranian authorities say they will install cameras in public spaces to identify and penalize unveiled women. Iranian police say the move aims to squash resistance against hijab law. Anyone caught on camera violating the law will be sent to will be sent a warning text with the consequences. The announcement follows last year's anti-government protests, after which a growing number of women began ditching their veils. We'll be right back.
There's tension in America with the push for green energy running up against rural residents trying to preserve a way of life. Now some claim the stakes are higher and could impact all of us with a growing number of food farms being gobbled up by solar farms. Cheryl Ackeson with Full Measure reports from Wisconsin where some rural landscapes are becoming a shiny sea of solar panels. This little windmill once powered a small water pump on the Polking Horns, Wisconsin dairy farm. Now it's surrounded by solar panels instead of cows. Tell me about what time period the solar came and did a company approach you or did you hear about it? Yes, it was oh, 2017 when they first approached, asked us uh, interested in solar and uh, no interest. But then uh, they keep coming back to convince you and all of a sudden my wife and I decide, you know, we're not gonna live forever. When we die, what happens to the farm? So in 2018, Bill Polkinghorn and his wife said yes to solar. They're getting paid two and a half times more to lease their land to this solar project than what a food farmer could pay. Solar power is rising in a big way in Wisconsin, thanks partly to big federal incentives provided at taxpayer expense. Brendan Conway is with WEC Energy Group, which owns six utilities companies. Why is Wisconsin such a good place for these projects that are coming in? One of the things we've made a real commitment to is reducing our carbon emissions. Um, and one of the ways we're doing that is you know, generating power with clean energy. The expansion of solar is also generating controversy, pitting farmers who are leasing their land to solar farms against those who want to keep it for agriculture. Elizabeth Groves lives on a small farm and is hoping to expand her micro beef operation. What's your concern about farmland being used for another purpose that can help people make quite a bit of money? So with what we've seen over the last two years with food shortages and supply chain issues, it just doesn't seem like a good solution to take some of our most productive uh, agricultural lands in the country out of production. Groves worries that leaders are losing sight of the long game, how less food farming stands to impact rural life for so many. It's going to affect uh, implement dealers and seed companies and um, feed dealers. There's going to be less product, you know, and so that's going to drive the prices up. And what is the trickle down effect going to be in, in our communities? In one Virginia county where there are seven solar projects proposed or already built, the Planning Commission is proposing to limit solar farms to 2% of prime farm soils. For Full Measure, I'm Cheryl Ackeson. We've long heard the eyes are the windows to the soul. It could also be a window to the brain, a way to detect Alzheimer's disease. Medical reporter Barbara Morse tells us about the latest research that focuses on the eyes. I'm in this research because I love it, but I'm also in it for personal reasons. Three of my four grandparents died from Alzheimer's disease. Jessica Alber is the uh, principal investigator really of this latest Alzheimer's study out of the University of Rhode Island. We have established that we do see changes in the eye in people at high risk for Alzheimer's. This has long been studied, but the most recent research out of Cedar sinai Medical Center was the largest. It looked at donated tissue from the retina and brains of Alzheimer's patients and compared them to those who didn't have the memory robbing disease. And what our group is doing is trying to develop a way to measure that in people who are still living. They'll be enrolling people between the ages of 65 and 80 for this five year study, most with no risk or symptoms of Alzheimer's and some with higher risk and mild symptoms. And we use similar equipment to what people have at their eye doctor, but we are are using kind of more advanced imaging techniques to get three-dimensional images of the back of the eye, the retina, and look at changes in the thickness of different layers of the retina and look for protein-related changes, the presence of proteins amyloid and tau that are in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. This research is made possible through a $10.3 million grant from the National Institutes of Health. 
In addition to the site in Rhode Island, Washington University at St. Louis will also be enrolling participants probably by this summer. I'm medical reporter Barbara Morse. Whether you're spending Easter with your family or hunting for eggs, this year's holiday spending is expected to reach a new high. The National Retail Federation expects shoppers to spend more than $24 billion on the holiday. That's up from last year's spending of $21 billion. And it tops the record high in 2020 when Americans spent just under $22 billion. The survey also found those celebrating will spend nearly $200 on average. Salmon fishing along most of the West Coast has been shut down. Federal regulators voted to officially close the 2023 Chinook salmon fishing season from Cape, from Cape Falcon in Oregon to the California-Mexico border. The decision comes after officials say almost record low numbers of the fish returned to the California rivers last year. Scientists say the salmon population has declined quickly after years of drought. Samsung says it's going to make a meaningful cut to its chip production. The announcement comes after Samsung posted its lowest profit for any quarter in 14 years to begin 2023. The cut comes after Samsung said that demand for its chips has declined as the global economy deals with inflation. The company did not say how big the planned chip production cut was. And a new survey shows many Americans support a four day work week. DD Gatton with the National Desk has more on how employers are looking to adapt to this demand in the job market. This is really gaining traction, and experts say companies are now testing out changes to recruit and retain workers. According to a monster survey of more than 800 workers in March of this year, 61% of workers say they'd rather have a four rather than the traditional five day work week. The survey also found 33% would quit their job to find one with a four-day work week, and 10% would accept lower pay to make it happen. Unfortunately, the sign-on bonuses haven't always worked the way they were intended. They, they do entice people to apply, but then once people are on the job, if they're um, incentivized by another company's sign-on bonus, then they may end up job hopping. As we see more companies start to experiment with this, I think more companies may then try to pilot a new way, a new uh, flexible work schedule. And I'm told seeing jobs could be done at home or hybrid or during the pandemic has driven more companies to accommodate flexible work schedules, trying out dis different scenarios that fit the company's goals from a four day work week and one day off to that one day being spent working from home. Reporting for the National Desk, I'm Didi Gatton. And just like the Oklahoma City Thunder, the rain is making a comeback this week. Fox 25 meteorologist Ross Muma has her back with tonight's forecast. Ross, what, what, what was, excuse me, what should we expect for this week to come? Hey, well, I like that. Yeah, the Thunder are back. They're in the play-in tournament. And you're right, we did also see some rain return back to uh, some very much needed spots of the state. Western Oklahoma saw some rain here earlier this evening. Very weak trough moved through, but this is a, a quick time-lapse video from our Cumulus Lake. Hefner camera. You can see beautiful sunset, but also some of those clouds and thunder showers rolling in there. Uh, this brought some nice rain to parts of Canadian County out near El Reno. Similar story up near Kingfisher as well. So just west of OKC saw some rain, but actual downtown stayed dry tonight, but could be a little bit of a different story tomorrow afternoon and evening through the daytime for your Monday. It'll be a fairly similar story as to what we saw today. Mix of sun and clouds, partly to mostly cloudy skies. Temperatures going to be in the upper 60s by lunchtime, low to mid 70s then once again by the afternoon. But we are expecting uh, another round of some scattered showers, and if not, a few isolated thunderstorms by late afternoon and then throughout the rest of the evening, mainly here across the I-35 corridor and really that entire swath uh, across that central part of the state. So. Time it out for you here. Here's about two to three o'clock. You're going to start to see uh, really just a few uh, isolated pop up storms or showers begin to develop here, uh, kind of right along the I 40 and I 44 corridor in the central part of the state. As you move closer towards dinner time, then four to five o'clock, you're going to start to notice a few heavier downpours, maybe one or two stronger storms here. You're seeing a little bit of some red and even some pink popping up there near Oklahoma and Cleveland County, out near the Chandler and Luther area as well. So we do do have at least a little bit more rain on the way than uh, through the rest of your Monday evening tomorrow, but rain totals probably won't be all that much, really anywhere from about a tenth 
upwards of maybe a quarter of an inch, although uh, we could see some locally higher amounts depending on where some of those heavier downpours and thunderstorms do happen to roll on through. But we desperately need the rain here. We can do without the storms for sure, but we'll take as much rain as we can get. We've only gotten about one one hundredth of an inch of rain so far here in April so far uh, just over uh, three quarters of an inch uh, of rain below average for really uh, the year and the month. So we'll take as much as we can get and tomorrow night's our last chance here for really the next about four to five days. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, sunny skies, warm temperatures, mid to upper 70s all three days and the winds also going to pick up a little bit more here as well. So that's also going to bump up our wildfire threat mainly across western and northwestern Oklahoma starting on Wednesday and then continuing through your Thursday and Friday and then Friday. That will be the next day uh, that we're going to be keeping close tabs on. This is going to be our next weather maker. Strong cold front's going to move through. That's going to bring the chance for some scattered showers and storms, mainly across central uh, and eastern Oklahoma uh, Friday night into early Saturday morning and then much cooler temperatures behind it. We're going to be dropping out of the low 80s on Friday back down into the upper 60s then by next Saturday and Sunday. A growing battle within our nation's libraries. An Idaho bill would allow parents to sue public schools and libraries over material deemed harmful that their child used. But some say this bill and efforts similar nationwide to restrict content is what's harming our nation's youth. D.D. Gatton is back with with more on both sides of this issue. More and more we're hearing of lawmakers taking action to restrict access children have to certain material at the library. What some argue is a way to protect, some parents tell me is harming their child's access to different perspectives. I ran for office to protect kids and that's exactly what I'm doing. By, with this bill. Under an Idaho bill, a parent could sue a library for $2,500 in damages if a minor gets material with sexual content that's determined to be harmful to children when applying contemporary community standards. It's sex between male and female, sex, sex between two males, sex between two women. It's other kinds of sex, um, not intercourse. Uh, it's just these materials are not, should not be made available to minors. I just don't think that's the right message. I think we need to build trust within our librarians and with our teachers. Like, I feel like we should have informed conversations with our kids about like what sex is and what like different perspectives mean. Growing divisions over the books your children have access to at public libraries nationwide from Texas. If it has sexually explicit material in it, I would view that as an incredible win for the students of the state to not have that material in the in the library. To Michigan. Without doubt, prepubescent individuals that are uh, depicted in the book and illustrated in the book graphically. The American Library Association says in 2021 they reported more than 700 attempts to quote, censor library resources targeting nearly 1,600 books in the U.S., the highest number of attempted book bans, they say, since the group began documenting this more than 20 years ago. As the list grows, some have raised concerns over First Amendment rights being violated and questions over whether LGBTQ content is being targeted. With the Idaho law, <clears throat> there's a dimension to this that's, that's very different. You're not telling anybody directly that they can't have these materials, which gets you around the First Amendment problem, since you're not restricting anybody's speech. However, you add the second part of this, and that is anybody could sue you for having them. That's a way to circumvent the whole First Amendment issue. History and law professor at Cedarville University, Dr. Mark Clausen, points out books deemed harmful to children can vary from state to state. In Idaho, Governor Brad Little vetoed the bill, saying in a letter Wednesday it makes blanket assumptions on materials that could be seen as harmful to minors. Reporting for the National Desk, I'm Dee Dee Gatton. Coming up on Fox 25 Sports Sunday, the NBA regular season ended today, but the Thunder season is not over. Today they faced Memphis in what was a warm-up for their play-in game later this week. The news not nearly as good for Oklahoma and Oklahoma State's basketball teams. Both programs are losing players to the transfer portal, which means 
new and hopefully as good or better options that will be available. The golf season's first major, the Masters produced a first time winner. While this weekend's NASCAR stop produced a driver who landed in the winner's circle for the first time this season. You know, football is going to be part of the show. With Oklahoma getting a big time commitment while OSU discusses how new leaders must be stepping up with a new defensive coordinator in town. Those stories and more coming up on Fox 25 Sports Sunday. Take a look at this. Some orangutans have the opportunity to enjoy an Easter treat this morning. Sophia and Heidi, two orangutans at the Brookfield Zoo in Illinois, went on an Easter egg hunt. Workers hid hard, hard boiled eggs throughout the habitat and zoo staff called the egg hunt an enrichment exercise to physically and mentally stimulate the animals. If the orangutans didn't find them all, I'm sure they'll start smelling here before you know oh it. Oh boy, <laughs> yeah, keep your eye out for that for sure. Well, just in time for Easter, speaking of, this bunny is the newest member of a California police department, and that's not a typo. Yuba City Police Officer Ashley Carson found this lost rabbit in the middle of the road last October. No one claimed him, so of course the department did, and named him Officer Percy. Officer Percy has his own canine harness and serves as the department's wellness and support officer. How about that? Well, if you missed out on the Shamrock Shake this year, McDonald's has you covered. The fast food chain announced it is launching a new limited edition McFlurry Strawberry Shortcake. It's a vanilla base like all McFlurries and then it also has strawberry flavored clusters and shortbread cookies blended in. The new McFlurry, if that ice cream machine works, it hits <laughs> McDonald's on Wednesday. Yeah, that's always a toss up when you yeah. go to the drive through, right? Yeah, you always have to find that location <laughs> where it works. They're far and few in between, let me just tell you that. Well, stunning new visuals from the James Webb Space Telescope, Uranus, its rings, and six of its 27 known moons. NASA says Uranus rotates on its side and has extreme seasons. The ice giant takes 84 years to orbit the sun. It has 13 no ring, known rings, and you can see 11 in this picture on your screen. As a, impressive as this is, NASA says it's only the tip of the iceberg of what the Webb Telescope can actually do. Ross? Man, our, our producer Zach just doing us dirty with that Uranus story right before weather tonight. Yeah. Come on, man. What a segue. Come on. All right. We got another chance for some rain and isolated thunderstorms tomorrow afternoon and evening. After that, it's pretty quiet the rest of the week. Beautiful weather, sunny skies, temperatures in the mid to upper 70s through Thursday, low 80s for Friday. But we'll also see another chance for some rain and storms with our next cold front coming through. That's then going to drop our temps back into the upper 60s for next weekend and Curtis hopefully with the sunny and warm weather there on Wednesday thunder can luck out here. Yeah, Wednesday night in New Orleans. It's going to be a big night. Oklahoma City in the play in tournament. We know exactly who they're playing when they're playing all the stuff, but they had some unfinished business today to take care of at the Paycom Center. We'll tell you about it next.